Welcome everyone. I'm Karen. I am a 20 plus year kinesiologist that helps people get to the root of their chronic pain. I love using holistic remedies like essential oils and mindset to give people give to help with giving people a broader perspective on what may be causing their pain. I'm so happy to have you all here. This is number two of my very casual podcast. And what my intention is with these podcasts is just to bring information from amazing experts to help with all facets of inflammation. So today I have with me, I'm so excited to introduce Katie, and I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, so I'm not even going to try. Nobody really is. It's okay. <laughs> it's Herzig. Hungarian. I married a Hungarian, so it's a Hungarian last name, Herzig. Oh, that's so cool. So my great grandmother was Hungarian. And so I grew up with all sorts of like Hungarian dishes. So okay. we have yeah. that in common. I love, I love paprika, something that, you know, is, is very good anti-inflammatory spice that I like to cook with. We can talk what, more about that. What is it? Pa paprika. Oh, paprika. Yeah. Paprika. Love... My, my husband's grandmother was, was, hung, you know, was born in Hungary and raised in Hungary. And she had this very thick Hungarian accent and she would say the paprika. So I love it. Why? Yeah, <laughs> that's, good on almost, that's good on almost anything. Mm -hmm, it is. So before Katie introduces herself more, I just want to share the way that we met because I just love the story. Um, so some of you guys know, I've got my best friend, Harley, who is our two and a half year old puppy. And every day we take Harley on a walk on a path that's behind our house. And we met Katie's mom, Linda, and her baby, Chloe, who is a Labradoodle, no, Golden Doodle. Golden right? Doodle, yeah. Okay, Golden yeah. Doodle, adorable <laughs> Golden Doodle. Um, and so Harley and Chloe play all the time, and I'm going to post a picture of them because it's so cute. Mm -hmm. um, so Linda and I have become good friends, and all of a sudden the other day, and we've been friends now, I think for like, gosh. Well, Harley's two and a half. It feels like I've known your mom for so much longer, but really it's only been like two years, which is true spirits. Because you know, you. we yeah. talk about all the things and it's like we watch our dogs play. And mm -hmm. now Chloe's not so into Harley because she's <laughs> Harley, but Harley still loves her. Um, but like Linda, Katie's mom, was talking about Katie and just how helpful she has been with some family stuff going on with diet. And I thought, gosh, this is someone I need to connect with. And it never had occurred to me before when, you know, she talks all about her kids all the time. And at the same time, my amazing community has been asking for more diet and uh, nutrition information for them, um, for their anti-inflammatory lifestyle. And so that's how we met. And I'm just happy to be here with you and I'll let you take it from here and just introduce. Yes. Yourself. I I'm so excited. And you know, my, you, the two, you and my mom are kindred spirits and you've helped my mom with some issues that she was having with her hip. And similarly, she told me all about you and I'm so excited and so happy to have the connection, um, through my mom, who's also amazing and very like-minded. Yeah. Um, and really, you know, my mom, it's one of the reasons I got into this work actually, because she was always taking, she was interested in alternative medicine. I think, you know, since we were children and we were going to chiropractors and we would go to naturopaths and um, I think just interested in finding alternative ways to heal other than traditional medicine. And so I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's uh, thyroid disease when I was pretty young, I was in my twenties. Um, and with my mom's help and kind of through my own research was able to go, you know, through alternative medicine, heal my thyroid, went through my own weight loss journey. So I was a personal trainer. I'm a personal trainer. Um, I'm a clinical nutritionist and a life coach. So now I help people, you know, really with that trifecta, you know, we have healing through nutrition, you know, healing through physical exercise and then also the mindset piece. So kind of integrating those three to find balance and to find vibrancy and to, you know, reach our ideal body weight and also have the energy and the vitality to live life to the fullest, which is what we all want. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. I love that intro and just thank you for being here. And she My pleasure. has four kids you. and she has, she is an entrepreneur and just so much going on. So I just value your time. And I just want to say thank you just for being here with us. 
Um, I know so many people are gonna get so much out of this. So I would say when I ask my community, like what is the number one thing that you need help with when it comes to nutrition, they're so confused and it makes sense. There's so much information out there. There's documentaries showing that a plant-based vegan diet is the best. There's documentaries showing that just eat fat and meat and that's the best. It's all sorts of extreme stuff, right? And they just want to have some basic, I guess, rules of thumb on what is best for them to choose to help with dealing with their chronic inflammation. Cause it's funny. And I think a lot of people don't actually even realize that there's that connection. I have clients all the time, you know, that I ask about their diet or have they tried to tweak stuff? And they're like, how could that even be part of my knee pain? My knee pain is because I go running and, Mm -hmm. you know, I think you and I both where we're on such the same wavelength is that we see the body as a whole mind, Mm -hmm. body, spirit. Right. And so everything impacts everything. So if you were to just to give some basic tips for people looking for an easy program to follow, which I know is probably not going to be easy for you, (laughs) um, but they're confused. Yeah. Where where would you, what direction would you point them in? Yeah. And you know, that is so true. We are not taught about nutrition. You know, we're really not taught about what is food. Why, you know, we're told to eat our vegetables, but why, why should I eat my broccoli? Well, because my mom said, and then, you know, for many of us, as soon as we get out of our parents' house, it's like pizza and Taco Bell all day long, because that's what tastes good. But food is really information, right? All food gives information to your cells. It gives information to your DNA. It tells your body how to express its DNA. It is, there is pro-inflammatory food and there is anti-inflammatory food. So your diet has a lot to do with what is going on internally. Um, every, I mean, I would say everything. There are so many chronic diseases. I mean, heart disease, cancer, um, uh, diabetes, you know, cardiometabolic disease, arthritis, even, you know, that the, these, these d- diseases are characterized by low grade cl- chronic inflammation, even Alzheimer's, right? Yeah. So, and we know, and and there's, there's a growing body of research that shows that nutrition can help not only to, you know, to, to help like treat these diseases, but also like we can, we can cure them. You know, these are lifestyle diseases often, some of them. So we can do a lot with, with diet for sure. Um, So what we want to do is avoid the pro-inflammatory food, right? And, and eat more of the anti-inflammatory food. Um. And like you said, there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there. You know, should we eat lots of meat? Should we go plant-based? What should we do? So, you know, the, the diet or the dietary pattern that has the best evidence, the best research supported evidence is the Mediterranean diet, which is a very anti low inflammation diet. So a lot of what I do and what I'm going to be talking about today is based on the Mediterranean diet. It's called a diet, but I like to think of it more as an eating a pattern of eating. It's a dietary pattern right? I don't really like the word diet, right? Because a diet mean, you know, the idea that we get when we have gone on a diet is that we're going to end, we're going to stop at some point, but this isn't, this is a lifestyle, right? So the ministry, we're going to restrict or suffer in some way, right? So it's, yeah, it's gotten a bad rap. Right. The Mediterranean diet is characterized by, um, nuts and seeds. It's high in fat. So you're going to get about 40 to 50% of your, your calories from fat, olive oil, um, omega-3s. So omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory and we can only really get them in the diet in certain ways. So chia seeds, flax seeds have them. However, in chia seeds and flax seeds, the form is alpha linoleic, alpha linoleic acid, which is not the active form. So we actually have to convert it. We have to go through multiple um, conversion steps. To, to get it into the active form, which is DHA. So only about 10% is converted. So we wanna make sure that we're getting it. If we get it in our diet, we wanna make sure it's cold water fish. So salmon, um, mackerel, sardines are really good sources. Most people aren't eating enough <laughs> cold water fish during the week to get adequate amounts of omega-3s in their diet. 
especially because omega-3s compete with omega-6s for a, the same metabolic pathway. Omega-6s are very pro-inflammatory, -in so they're very inflammatory. And in the standard American diet, we get a whole lot of omega-6s. Omega-6s are in saturated fats, so like butter, like um, fatty meats, like hamburgers and steak and um, hot dogs, right? Think about the standard American diet. We get a lot of fried food. Omega-6s are very, they're in like vegetable oil. So because we're getting so many omega-6s in the American diet, the omega-6s really crowd out what little omega-3s we're getting. And so we're, it's very, it, it triggers a lot of inflammation in the body. Now we need both. We need, we need a good balance of both. What the research supports is that we really want like a one to one to one to four ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s, right? Most Americans have like you know, maybe a one to 50, you know, 50 omega sixes for every one omega three. Okay. Um, so really want to be eating a diet that is rich in omega three fatty acids. Um, so fish, you know, eating cold water fish, um, lots of vegetables, you know, lots of color, like, like it's a vibrant color, Like the more color, the better you want at least five servings of vegetables a day, um, berries, you know, fruit, um, and then you want whole grains. So, you know, I, there's a lot of talk out there about gluten. Should I eat gluten? Should I not? Should I have grains? Should I not? Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, for most people, there, uh, there are a good amount of people who have a gluten sensitivity for sure. Mm -hmm. And if you have celiacs, like, you, you know, you have celiacs, you have a, an allergic response if you have gluten. For most people, you know, gluten isn't that big of an issue. What we want to be doing is we want to make sure that if we're having those carbohydrate, you know, that those we're having gluten in, in the form of like whole grains. So like, um, like a whole wheat, right? So mm -hmm. we want to get rid of the refined flour, the refined bread, white rice. Instead, we want to be going more toward, um, brown rice, wild rice, quinoa, um, amaranth, spelt, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is, so I have had some of the markers for celiac and I believe mm -hmm. I probably do have it because mm -hmm. I just respond terribly to it. And yeah, quite a few, few people do. Yeah. yeah. And so I always say gluten's a devil, but I, I totally relate with you too, that like not everybody has gluten sensitivities. Mm -hmm. um, but do you see a correlation? Cause for me too, like with, if I overdo the grains, I start feeling so inflamed, even if it's like organic rice, um, quinoa doesn't do well with my body. So how come, and there's probably so many layers to this with like autoimmune disorders and traumas and stress and things like that. How come some people seem to do just fine with certain diets and some people just blow up and just feel terrible, even with eating some of like the healthier grains. Cause, yeah. cause I, I actually just stopped eating. I was eating probably too much gluten-free bread and I started not feeling good. Mm -hmm. And I know you'll probably say that there's a lot of junk that they put. Yeah. In yeah. Just product. because something is gluten-free does not mean that it's, you know, healthy or, yeah. you know, a lot of times it's the processed food. You know, what we want to mm -hmm. do when we're thinking about, you know, a, a low inflammation diet, we want to be moving away from anything that is preserved, anything that has um, extra chemicals or is, or is mechanically adjusted in any way. And often when you look at, you know, gluten-free bread or gluten-free tortillas, it, it is very processed. So a good rule of thumb is if it didn't exist, you know, 150 years ago, if your great grandmother didn't eat it, then your body probably doesn't really know what it is. Yeah. I love that. So it's a, it's a very layered, like you said, it's a layered. I mean, on the one hand, if your body, it's information for your cells. And if your body doesn't recognize what it is, it's going to create inflammation because inflammation is your body's way of fighting off a foreign invader. Right. Inflammation happens when your body doesn't know necessarily what something is. And so it's trying to protect you. So it sends white blood cells and it creates this inflammation to try to like flush out the problem, Yeah, which is a good thing. We need yeah. acute inflammation, which is why we need omega-6s. You know, it would yeah. be a horrible thing to completely eliminate omega-6s from your diet. There's omega-6s in walnuts, right? Lots of many foods have a ratio, a good proportion of omega-6s and omega-3s together because we need them. We need that acute inflammation inflammatory response. If you, you know, cut your finger, you want that inflammatory response to come and heal your finger, right? You're going to get some swelling. You're going to get some pain. It's going to be red. That's your, your immune system working to heal you. 
The problem oh. is when it becomes chronic. The problem is when your body doesn't shut it off. It needs to be acute. So it, it comes, it's acute, it peaks, and then it goes away. The problem is when it doesn't go away and it kind of is like this chronic, it's like this in the background, kind of like always, your immune system's always on alert. So on the one hand, we have processed foods and chemicals and preservatives and food dyes that our body does not recognize. That's creating chronic inflammation. Another thing is that we're all so unique. And that is why one diet does not fit all people. Yeah. Right. We all have different genetics. We have different preferences. Um, you might have a food sensitivity that could be because, you know, of an autoimmune condition. It could be because you were under chronic stress and because you, you ate that certain food at that certain time, your body had a reaction to it. Mm -hmm. But the good news is for the most part, if it's a food sensitivity, you can heal that. So yeah. that is really important to recognize because the more that you eat a food that you're sensitive to, the worse the inflammation is going to get. But if you can identify what this what the food sensitivity is, eliminate it from your diet for three to six months, allow your gut to heal, right? And your body to kind of reset. Mm -hmm. Then you can reintroduce the food. And typically in like 90% of the cases, you are able to reintroduce the food and mm -hmm. you're, you're okay. Um, and that's assuming that you're, you're not, you're following more of an anti-inflammatory diet, right? You're, you're taking out all of the things that are causing that inflammation. Um, there's so and, many and making sure, you know, yeah. there's so many things that you said that I want to touch on, but I'm going to mm -hmm. backtrack for a second. Um, and I get like, so I get so excited about this topic because I just, there's so much that we could go into. <laughs> uh, you ready for a three hour long podcast? <laughs> right. I mean, we'll probably have to do a couple different things. <laughs> But backing up and just talking about having people implement more salmon and seed and nuts into their diet, I know people are going to be saying, well, how much, like what, and I know everyone's different. It depends on so many different factors. So I know we're staying very basic. And then at the end, I want you to tell people actually what you do with your clients, because you get really into like the depths of what each person needs, which is so important. So I want you guys all listening here to know that like, for me, I can't do whole grains right now. So she's giving like, we're giving a basic overview, but she gets way more in depth with her clients. But when we talk about anti-inflammatory foods, do you, do you want people to, or do you encourage people to eat them with every single meal? Or is it like, you just have one piece of salmon a day and you're okay in a general sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on what it is, right? Okay. So I would say so the way that I teach this with my clients, it's really simple to go over right now is, um, PFF plus. So it's protein, fiber, fat at every meal. And then plus plus is for superfoods and phytonutrients, which is just another way of saying, you know, you want to get the vegetables because the vegetables have the anti-inflammatory, um, factors. They are, you know, there's, there's different like medicinal properties in, in different foods. So we want to make sure that we're getting all of the information that your body needs to perform at its best. Um, so extra greens, always leafy greens at every meal, if possible. Um, so you want protein, fiber, fat at every single meal. Okay. I would say fish three times a week. You don't need to have fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That would be, that would, <laughs> that would be a way. I don't know anyone that loves fish that much that would, but I think, you know, three times a week is, is a good place to start. Um, and if you don't love fish, that's okay. I would say an omega-3 supplement is, is, is a good way to get, the omega threes into your diet. I think most people, I don't often give like a universal statement of something that everybody should be taking. I really like to look at people individually, but omega three fatty acids are one of those supplements. That I do feel very comfortable saying every single person should be taking one. Um, and some, some advice for that is look at the supplement. So if it says that there's, you know, like 1200 milligrams of, um, omega threes, look at the ingredients and make sure that, that most of that is EPA and DHA. Cause often they'll, they'll pack it full of other stuff and then the actual active ingredients will be very small. So you want to make sure you're getting a good amount of EPA and DHA because that's the active form of omega-3. Do you um, think that a supplement, taking a supplement is as good as food or given the choice, would you tell someone just to eat the food? So I always, always would prefer nutrition first, always, okay. but that's not always realistic. Right. And it really depends on the person. Um, and I would rather use a supplement 
and make sure that that a person is getting everything that they that they need, then leave it up to to chance. A supplement is an easy way to make sure that we're checking all of the boxes, that we're providing all of the foundations that we need for health. Um, and then we can figure out how to work it into the diet other ways. I mean, because it's complicated to do it with diet, right? Like we are so food is so much more than just, you know, I need it for the vit- the B vitamins. I mean, it's emotional, it's social. We all have a history with food. We have preferences, we have things that we like. So if it was as easy as just saying like, here's, here's how much you need to get omega-3s and B vitamins and vitamin D and, you know, zinc and all this stuff, it, it would be easy, but it's not that simple. Right. Um, so what I do as nutritionists is I will usually have my clients do the three-day food diary. We'll just kind of look at what they're eating, okay. um, what they're getting through their diet and then what their symptoms are. And then we do some other things to like, we, we run labs and stuff like that. So we're getting a full picture of the whole person mm-hmm. and then we can build a plan from there. So not everybody needs supplements, but most people do need some. And omega threes are one of those supplement that I that there's there's just there's a lot of evidence out there showing that we the more omega threes that we can have the better. So I feel pretty confident recommending it to most people, especially if you're someone who's dealing with pain. Mm-hmm. If you're dealing if you're dealing with something where you know that there's inflammation in your body, omega three can really help with that. So that would be a great starting point. Awesome. Thank you. And so let's talk about conversely, what we want them to avoid. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be anything pro-inflammatory. So any of those omega-6s. So when I say omega-6, what I mean is saturated fat. So saturated fat is in animal meat. And I'm not saying don't eat animal meat. I'm just, we're going to limit, we're going to like back off a little bit on it. So I'll tell you exactly what I mean in a minute. So um, avoid, you know, limiting animal fat, um, limiting like butter is a saturated fat um, and vegetable oil is another saturated fat. So you want to avoid those inflammatory oils. So when you're picking an oil, you know, choose olive oil, avocado oil, or coconut oil. Now coconut oil is a saturated fat, and this is where the, the research gets interesting. And this is where it is not so cut and dry, right? It is not so easy as to say, just avoid saturated fat and you'll be fine because coconut oil is a saturated fat, but it also has some other interesting properties and it's, you know, it's biochemistry. So I won't go <laughs> into it and bore all of you, but because of some of the other things, research supports that it's very anti-inflammatory. So I typically do include coconut oil in my clients' diet plans. Depend- it depends on the situation though. Um, it's so so funny you like- bring up, I love that you bring up coconut oil because I used to do um, corporate uh, lunch and learns and mm-hmm. the company that hired me would make you know, the outlines for me just to kind of talk about. And I was doing a nutrition talk and uh, it said, it told people not to eat coconut oil. And oh, I, was, you're like, oh. <laughs> I was like, I might get fired for saying this you guys, but I don't think that's actually the best advice. So do your own research. There's yeah. some mixed, there is, there is some mixed about. things out there. And that is why it is so confusing to go out there. You know, yeah. there's, there's one camp that loves coconut oil and puts coconut oil in everything. And there's another camp that says, don't eat any saturated fat at all. That's going to give you heart disease. But actually the research shows that cardio, that coconut oil lowers the bad cholesterol and raises the good cholesterol. Right. Yeah. So that's very supported in the research. Um, and I again, if you, so you know, to- yeah, to bring it all in together, like the, what you said, I think is so great for people to keep in mind is if it wasn't eaten a hundred years ago by your great grandparents, if you don't recognize the ingredients, it's probably going to be pro-inflammatory because your body doesn't know what to do with it. We haven't evolved to be able to eat dye, red dyes and all this. Yeah, other if it looks like a science experiment, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then it's not, then your body doesn't know what it is. Yeah. And like, let's talk, I want to, I'm going to probably bring up a little controversial topic here, but let's talk about these fake meats that, Mm. you know, are being kind of like encouraged lately. Mm -hmm. What is your take on those? Um, I, you know, if it's processed, if there's chemicals in it, then your body does not know what it is. Yeah. So So much better just to eat, even if it's red meat, right. Then these like packaged fake meats that are made in a factory. Yes. But how about if you don't want to eat meat? And I think that this is very, again, this is very individualized Mm -hmm. and it really is going to depend on the person. There are certain health conditions where I would say, yes, let's do a plant-based diet. Okay. But that is very, can you share what that would be? I know. Yeah. So that it would depend on the person, but a lot of times, you know, if somebody has like a colon cancer, for example, Mm -hmm. which is what, you know, 
we're talking about health issues with my family. My, my father is a colon cancer survivor um, or he's in remission. So this is something that we've been dealing with in my family for a long time. And this is something that's a very, you know, much a concern of mine as his daughter, right? And so I'm making sure that everybody in my family is doing everything that we can for our gut health. Um, and I eat meat and I eat red meat, so I'm not doing plant-based, but if somebody had part of their bowel resected, mm -hmm. then, then it's probably a good idea to go plant-based for a time. You know, again, okay. what we're looking for here is we're looking to remove triggering foods, anything that's going to be triggering. And, and sometimes some, so we need different digestive enzymes in order to break down and absorb different foods. Often I see if someone is having um, indigestion or GERD or like heartburn, mm -hmm. a lot of times they're not you know, sometimes it's a problem with their stomach acid, right? So they could have like a low stomach acid or too much stomach acid. Usually it's low. Another problem is they're not making the digestive enzymes to break down particularly meat. Okay. So especially red meat. Um, so if I'm working with somebody that's having some digestive issues, I want to look at, okay, what's causing it. Mm -hmm. So there might, it might sometimes depending on the person, it might make sense to remove meat for a little while, go more plant-based, mm -hmm. you know, increase the fiber. Mm -hmm. And then we can slowly start adding one different kind of animal meat at a time to see how, what, how your body reacts. Um, and then if we need to put in some digestive enzymes, then we can do that as well. So yeah. it's really just going to depend on the person. Um, there's a couple other things. Maybe I would consider it, but I wouldn't suggest doing it. And in, in what I just described, taking it away and then adding it, unless you were working with somebody who was directing you um, and was doing it, you know, evidence-based. Yes. I was just going to say that because I actually tried to go plant-based. I had a friend that convinced me that this is a way to go. She's kind of like mm -hmm. my wellness health friend that we're always talking about different things. And, um, and I did it. I'm very much like, I can, t I can tend to be, I've gotten much better, but like an extremist where it's like, if I'm going to go, I'm going to do it all out. Um, mm -hmm. which I love the way you just described it. It's like, it's a journey. You take some out, you figure it out, you add it back in, like doing anything extreme for your body is not a good thing whether it's movement, diet, whatever it is. And, um, I felt good, really good for a while, but then my body rebelled big time. And I craved chicken. Like it was chocolate cake. Like literally <laughs> I remember getting one of those whole foods, rotisserie chickens. And I was like, <laughs> give me all the chicken. I was like, the skin. I was like, wait, my body. Was like, uh, it was like, it was candy. It was yeah. crazy. And I'm like, yeah. okay, this is not normal. Like I obviously need some meat and I'm actually type O blood type, which I've read. I don't know if you, how you feel about the whole blood type thing, but I've heard that O's need more meat. Um, yeah, it's, but, interesting. it's interesting. I yeah. think that there is something to that I, yes. because of what I know about genetics. I do, okay. I do okay. think that there is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, no, that was just, um, and then, yeah, I just felt terrible. And then like you go the extreme the other way, and then you eat all this meat because your body's craving it. It's just not good to do anything yeah. very extreme. Same with like those keto diets. And, and I agree. And that. I think especially when you're healthy, you know, I think yeah. that there are different levels of intervention that are necessary depending on the different pathologies that are going on. So someone who is dealing with cancer, mm -hmm. maybe it makes sense to go to a more extreme dietary intervention than someone who is you know, healthy and, you know, maybe just, just trying to, you know, I work with a lot of women, you know, maybe going through, through menopause and they're wanting to, you know, have energy and lose a little bit of belly fat that they've gained. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go so extreme with someone like that because we don't need to, we don't right. need to. And right. I think that's, that's where people are surprised sometimes is that often it's just a couple of little tweaks. It's nothing crazy or like, you don't have to turn your whole life upside down. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's almost easier for people to like, like you were saying, go so hardcore Yeah, because the moderation can be a little bit tricky. It can be a little bit hard. And sometimes we don't always trust ourselves. So we think if we, if yeah. I'm going to, if I'm going to go, you know, totally plant-based or totally keto, then yeah. I'm stuck, I'm committed to this. And, and we don't have to kind of trust yourself around regular food. It's, it's, it's learning how to trust yourself, trust your intuition, like leaning into your own body wisdom. And yeah. I think you know, if you, if you're making the decision about what to eat from a place of love mm -hmm. combined with the knowledge, right. I think that if that, that is, that is 
really the recipe for success and for longevity. I mean, if it's not something that you can do for the rest of your life, for most people, then it's not the right thing. But again, if you're someone who's dealing with, with like a rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or, um, like, uh, I, I have seen, you know, type, type one diabetes, there is some evidence about going plant-based. So that's it. That's a lifelong autoimmune disease. So for someone like that, maybe we want to look at some, some more extreme interventions, but I think for most people, and I think most people who are listening, maybe probably don't need to go that far. However, I mean, if, if there is, you know, lentils and beans are fantastic for you and most Americans do not eat enough. So if you're going to go, you know, plant-based, or even if you want to cut back on the meat a little bit, like mm-hmm. meatless Mondays is something that, you know, I've had people do where we want to lean more into like the lentils and the beans and like, and there's some delicious Mediterranean recipes that are full of beans. Beans have you know great fiber and they're a great source of zinc and lots of other vitamins um, that are, are fantastic for us. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I think that's, that's a great way to do it. You don't have to do like a, a meatless burger. You can not eat meat, get enough of the nutrients that you need by eating lentils, you know, by, Good to know. You know, and I would say one more thing I will say is if you are a vegetarian, um, you want to pay attention to the amino acids that you're eating because the only place in your diet that you can get a complete, like an essential amino acid, there are nine amino acids and um, five of them are essential. That means that we can't get them outside of our diet or we can't get them inside. We, we have to get them from our diet, right? Exogenously versus endogenously. Um, we can't, we can only get them in complete form from meat. Right. Mm-hmm. So we can get them from non-meat sources, but they have to be in the right combinations. Um, so there's something that I would pay attention to if I was a vegetarian, just making sure that do a little bit of research on that and make sure that you're getting when you're putting your meals together, that you're putting your like, for example, um, like rice and beans mm-hmm. have enough. They have the, the combination of uh, um of proteins to to that will cover that. But like if you're just eating rice by itself, it doesn't. So okay. you want to make sure you essential amino acids. Yeah, the combinations are important. You said something a couple sentences back, and I just love it. And I want to write this down for you to use again. And I'm not going to say it correctly, but it was something like if you're choosing love and knowledge, then you're going with your intuition. And it's, I want I wanted to talk to you about this today because this is something I talk to my community with all the time, right? It's like you don't need to push your body to a place of pain. And you, it's, it starts with loving yourself and to wanting to just feel the best and sometimes just shutting out the rest of the noise that you hear. And these days you see it, gosh, all over social media with, um, I'm intuitively eating and I'm eating my cookies and my potato chips. And you see these girls that look super fit on the outside. Again, you never know what's going on in the inside. Um, and it makes people think okay, well, if I really am craving something, that's my intuition and I should allow myself to have it. And I'll tell you, when I go to that place too much, it becomes a very slippery slope. And so for me, it's more of the question of, is my future self going to feel good after eating this food? It might feel really good and satisfying in the moment, but is it, is, am I going to feel good tomorrow morning when I wake up? Am I going to feel good tonight? Is it going to mess with my blood sugar? Like I, I think it's really dangerous for people to be teaching just to like free for all go with their intuition. Yeah. I think that there is this pendulum that we deal with, with food, right? On the one hand, we've got restriction and Mm self-loathing and like trying to beat ourselves into a smaller size and like limit how much we're eating. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you know, it's like this pendulum that, that swings back and forth. On the other hand, we have this idea that we should be able to eat whatever we want. And like, this is self-love eating all the cake and all the cookies and all the pizza, but neither of those things are love, right? Right. Neither of those things are giving your body what your body needs. The, the ideal situation or, or where we where we need to figure out a, a, a way to be is right in the middle mm-hmm. where we're not over restricting, but we're also not overindulging because mm-hmm. that's not love. Your body doesn't want, doesn't need you to be eating cupcakes all day long. And that's not, that's not love. That's creating inflammation. It's creating disease, right? But your body does, also doesn't want you to be, to be, you know, hating it 
and barely eating anything because then, you know, malnutrition is something that happens in this country a lot, like shockingly a lot. You know, I used to think before I went to grad school, I used to think that malnutrition was something that we just, you know, we hear about when we see, you know, poor kids in Africa who don't have enough food and they're like wasting away. And that was malnutrition. But then when I went to grad school and started reading the stats about malnutrition, I mean, this happens in this country all the time. And it's not just from people that aren't eating enough. It's from people who are eating the standard American diet, over consuming calories, but not eating enough nutrition, like dense nutrition that their body needs. I mean, that you can be overweight and, and malnourished, yeah. just like you can be underweight and malnourished. So self-love I, is somewhere cut, in the middle. Let me cut you off for a second. So how would that show up um, in your body if you were, because someone who is feeling like they are overweight, um, that's really interesting. And I totally agree with that and, and can see how that would be a thing. How, if they are malnourished, because a lot of times people are overweight because they're not getting enough calories and their metabolism is just like in fight or flight all the time. Right. And yes. so that's a big thing too. And I see it a lot on women, my age, for some reason, they're just so restrictive and just not getting enough. But, um, yeah, talk about that. Like, where would you see it? Like in your hair and your nails, like where in your body would you, would you see malnutrition? Yes. So there's a lot of places. So we do something um, called a nutrition focused physical exam that I do okay. with everybody. So that's actually where I, I meet mostly with people on video, but mm -hmm. like if you, if I was meeting with you, um, I would have you show me your nails and your hair and your hands and like your mm -hmm. face and have you come really close to the camera because there's a lot that we can see mm -hmm. physical signs of, it doesn't necessarily have to mean malnutrition. It could just mean that you need more zinc or you're not absorbing B vitamins, right? Or there's either something going on because everybody is so unique. And the RDA, which is the recommended daily allowance for different vitamins, was only based on how to prevent pathology, right? It doesn't was not necessarily based on health and how to prevent disease. It was this is the bare minimum that you need so that you don't get sick. <laughs> and everybody is so different. And we're learning more and more now how genetics play a role. You know, there is um, nutritional genomics, which is the study of how what we eat affects our DNA and how different DNA affects how different people interact with different foods. And so we can look at someone's genetics and build their ideal diet from that, which is amazing. That's amazing. So you um, do that for people when they work with you, you can look I, at- I don't yet, but I okay. can't. I, there are people that do it. It's a kind of a new- a new okay. field. So I'm fascinated. Certified to do. I can do it. I don't offer it in my practice yet, but hopefully, you know, if you're listening to this a year from now, yeah. <laughs> hopefully I will. But it's something I think that it's the next sort of phase of nutrition and of healthcare. Because you know, think about it, if we can if we can intervene in some of these chronic diseases years before they before they manifest, then we can save people's lives. You know, we can drastically cut the cost of, of healthcare in this country. Um, we can, we can change people's futures, which is amazing. Um, but yes, to answer your question, coming back around to your question, it would, there are signs. yes, you would have, um, hormonal acne is one way you could have weight gain for a lot of women, um, you know, in their forties, it's like belly gaining belly fat. Um, it could be, um, brittle nails we can see a lot, you know, in the nails, um, hair, like dull hair, oily, oily skin, lots of things, lots yeah. of things we, we can tell. Yeah. You mentioned the DNA piece in the very beginning. And when you and I were first talking about doing this podcast, you mentioned how you could have the DNA predisposition to get a certain disease. And if you change your diet, it can actually, you can actually change your DNA which is so fascinating because still there's so many people that are like, well, my mom had this, so I am predisposed to get it. And there's nothing I can do. And there's nothing more that just gives me the, the feeling of like, just being so ugh, like jumping out of my wanting to jump out of my skin, because I believe that we can change our DNA with so many different factors. Mindset is one, but, um, give me an example of like, as I, I think especially people talk about this with cancer. Well, my mom had breast cancer. My grandmother had breast cancer. My great mother, grandmother had breast cancer. So I just, 
And so there's a piece of the mindset where it's like, if you're going to man, you're already attracting it potentially, right? If you think you're going to get it, mm-hmm. but what, what about the diet piece? Like, how can that change disease? That, it's so disempowering, right? Mm-hmm. That's putting your power in the hands of something that you can't control. Yeah. And I would so much rather all of us take the power in our own hands and, yeah. and say, like, I'm empowered to do something about this. And that is the case with nutrition for most chronic diseases, including cancer. So there are some genetic diseases that it it is, I don't want to, I don't want to say that this is hundred percent the case all the time, because there are sure. cases where it's not, but for the majority of the cases, nutrition and lifestyle affect the way it's called epigenetics. So that's a study of how your lifestyle, including what you eat affects the way that your DNA is expressed. So these are called SNPs. So we have different SNPs in our DNA without getting too technical about it. Um, And what we eat, the things that we do, how we exercise, how much we sleep, how much stress we're under, send signals to these to either turn on or keep off a gene. So we can have genes switched on or switched off. So an example would be type two diabetes, right? If you have done any sort of genetic testing, like my dad did 23 and me, this is an example years ago. Mm-hmm. And it came back that he had the genetic predisposition for type two diabetes. Now there are many, like there, the, the science has kind of come a long way since then. So there's not just one gene for type two diabetes. It's very complicated. There's a lot, but he came back with markers for some that would indicate type two diabetes. However, he's 72. He does not have type two diabetes. So what that means is just because you have the gene that you could potentially have it does not mean that it's going to get turned on. What determines whether or not it gets turned on most of the time is what do you, what are you eating? How are you living? How are you moving? How are you sleeping? What's your stress? All of those affect your genes. But I would say the thing that affects them the most is what you eat Yeah, is your nutrition. So if we can, I mean, there is a chronic disease epidemic in this country, I mean, obesity, which, you know, is a precursor for cardiovascular diseases and type two diabetes and um, heart attacks and strokes and even cancer. I mean, it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent, younger and younger and younger. So if we can take a look at some of these things and intervene earlier and, and give people hope and give them power, let them know that they can do something about it yeah. unique to them. I mean, it's so much more powerful to have someone working with you saying, this is for you based on your genetics, based on your lifestyle, based on you, here's what we're going to do instead of just, well, you know, you need to lose weight. So eat less calories and exercise that nobody, nobody listens to that, but it's so much more empowering to have someone make a plan for you that is going to affect the way that disease manifests in your life in the future. But I think to me, and I hope that everyone is listening agrees here that the takeaway is that this is so encouraging. This is so exciting because we have so much more power than we ever realized over our health. It is not really something that, you know, even obesity, this is, you know, this, again, this, this research is, is just booming right now. We're discovering so much about obesity and yes, there are genes that predispose you to obesity, but there's so much that we can do. Mm -hmm. There's so much that we can do. So whether you have a family history or, you know, or your, whatever it is, feel empowered that there's something that you can do about it to change it. Yeah. To me, it's really motivating when I, you know, when I think about things that might be in my family, it's like, well, that's, I'm not going to have that you know, I'm like that stubborn, like I'm, it's not going to be me, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I I, say that, and I say that to family members and I think they roll their eyes at me because I'm kind of that one in the family, but it's, it's okay because maybe it will motivate or inspire somebody else, you know, that hears me say it deep down, um, that we do have the power to take our health back. And it's really exciting. And it's, you know, working with people like you to just educate us on how we can do that And, you know, one of the things I think people find the most challenging is if they've been living with chronic inflammation, like one of my community members said this to me, and I totally get it. You know, I've been living with this for like 30 years. I've tried all sorts of things, um, but maybe probably not. I don't think she's like worked with somebody. I think it's just tried different diets that have like she's read about or whatever. And she says, it just seems like it takes so long for me to start feeling a change. And so she wanted me to ask you, like, how long does it take until I really am going to feel a difference? Now, 
for me, like I just made like some tweaks in my, in my lifestyle about a month ago, actually I had a birthday a month ago and went to go get a colonic and had some epiphanies yeah. about some stuff I was doing. And I just am now feeling like the tweaks that I've made a month ago are like, I, I can feel changes. Like it doesn't, doesn't happen overnight, but I did start sleeping better pretty quickly. So what would you say to that? Like, it's hard to keep to, it's hard to trust the journey, but you have to trust the journey. And that it is really hard. It's hard right. when to keep going in faith, even when you're not always seeing the result mm -hmm. as fast as you want. And so I think that's where the mindset piece really comes in. Um, because it can take a little while, you know, it can omega threes are powerful. Um, there's other spices that you can use that are powerful. You know, cumin is, has more salicylates in it than a baby aspirin. Like there are, there's natural ways that you can heal, but it's not acute. Like it's not a medicine. So what medicines are, you know, they've taken their origin is they, they took natural foods and spices and herbs, and they mm -hmm. took out the most powerful parts, mm -hmm. right? Those, those things that give them their potency. And yeah. then they like, they synthesize them and increase them. And that's how they made them. So, and, and again, the pro I think that that is a wonderful thing. And I am so grateful for modern medicine for all of the things that it has given us. Um, and when you are in pain, or if you you know, have an acute injury or something, then, then that will save your life or that will help give you the bridge. Mm -hmm. to, you know, if you want to go a more natural route, it's going to take a little bit longer. But the thing about the natural route is your body recognizes what that is yeah. and it knows what to do. And I believe that our bodies want to heal yeah. and that they have the ability to heal if we give them, if we give our bodies the right ingredients to do that. So omega threes, you know, they could take about three months before you start to see oh, like wow. some actual results. So okay. you would see, I usually, I have people often, you know, keep a journal, mm -hmm. um, about, you know, how's their mood, how's their energy, how's their sleep, how's their, their hair and their skin and their nails. You might start noticing if you're not paying attention, you might not notice it, but if you are, then you will. And so it, it does it, some of the things, yes, you will notice right away. I mean, I've had I've people tell me they start following, you know, my PFF plus, and they're like, have more energy and then they know what to do with, or they're full, you know, they never have been able to have only three meals a day. They would always, you know, be eating six or snacking, six meals a day or snacking. And they're, they have so much energy and they're going six hours between meals and they can't believe it. And then sometimes if it's, if it's something where it's like chronic pain, it's not going to be like a, 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 an intervention where you take a pill and the pain goes away, right. but it will slowly get better over time. If you give it the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing is our body wants to keep us in homeostasis, mm -hmm. right? So if we're in fight or flight and like, I'll get a little technical here, our stress hormone cortisol, if it's up, it's up for a reason. Cause it's actually protecting us from getting sick and other pathogens coming in because it's sensing we're in fight or flight. Mm -hmm. so I think anytime we make a change, it takes the body a second to be like, I'm safe here. Oh, it's yeah. okay. I can let go. I can relax. And that happens when we're in any stressful situation and same yeah. thing with diet, exercise, all of it. So we have to almost give ourselves time to be like, it's okay to shift into this new place yes. and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm protected and I'm safe. And, and it's like, there's so much of a mindset. Do you, when you work with people, do you, do you talk about the emotional piece? Uh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> a lot, a lot I think you and I were laughing about this last time we talked. Like, if people come to me because they think that they want to lose weight or they want help with their hormones or their autoimmune disease, and uh, <laughs> what they realize that they didn't need or they didn't want was all the mindset work that we that yeah. we do. Is you know, I don't believe that we have symptoms in a vacuum, and I think that we are. You know, we are spiritual. We are you know physical. There are it. It is there is such a spiritual physical connection, and I don't. don't I think that true health comes from both. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, I talk a lot about this, you know, exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, that fight or flight response is a completely natural, healthy response for us to have. I mean, think about the way that we evolved. 
our ancestors needed this fight or flight response. I mean, they were fight, they were, everything could kill them, everything. Yeah. Right. And, and so they, they, this fight or flight response that we have now is, is remnant of our caveman ancestors. It didn't not evolve, right? We have our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that did evolve, that mm-hmm. has higher reasoning. But then we have our limbic system, which is like, thinks we're going to die every time we leave our house, right? Thinks that there's going to be a saber toothed tiger that's going to come and kill us. Yeah. And it doesn't know the difference between, you know, having a, a diet change or making a lifestyle change or being stuck in traffic or, you know, our having a fight with our spouse or having a boss that we don't like. It doesn't know the difference. Yeah. Um, so often for many of us, this stress goes unregulated because we have this kind of overactive limbic system that's constantly putting us into fight or flight, pumping out that cortisol, which, you know, does create inflammation. Um, and, and it doesn't support healing. You know, when you're in a, in a state of fight or flight, your body doesn't really care if it's healing or not, because it wants to, wants to keep you alive. If you're not alive, then who cares if you're, if you're not healing, right? It doesn't matter. Um, so it's really, we're, there's a certain amount of stress that we're not going to be able to change, right? We live in a stressful world. We can't, change that, you know, we have a mortgage and we have kids and we have, you know, stressful relationships and there's traffic sometimes, but what we can do is we can work on our mindset around that stress. And how are we, how are we actively practicing stress management and self-care? Um, I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Um, and and also I think another, yeah, good. good. I was just going to say, that's why I really feel like the investment to put into working with someone like you um, or any healer really is so valuable because, um, like I can already tell, and you guys were meeting for the first time today, actually. So <laughs> I feel like she's Katie's a face good to face, right? <laughs> first time face to face. <laughs> yeah, this first of a lot, a long lasting relationship, but, um, I can tell that you're very nurturing and, you know, you really need that nurturing coaching kind of hold hand holding partnership when you're trying to make a big change in your health. I truly believe that. Yes, we're empowered. Yes, we can do it. But there's nothing like having another teammate because people may have friends and family that are like, you're eating that? Like, that's not the right way to go. And they have no idea. Um, but to have someone in your- Love team, Lots of opinions. Yeah. Lots of opinions. <laughs> lots of opinions. To have someone on your team, um, that is worth so much of the financial investment that you will make in yourself. And the other piece is just to trust the process, like we said, and to keep going, even when you feel like there's no change being made. And this is in life in general, you're starting a new business, you're planting a tree, like you're not going to see the changes right away. Um, And so having a coach is so invaluable just to kind of keep you going and and to keep you feeling good and positive. Um, So I love that that's a piece of yeah. like what you I do think- and, and just along those lines, can you just give people an idea of like, if someone were to reach out to you, um, and I don't know if it's just all individualized or you have kind of like a program that you do with most people, but how would you work with them? If someone said, I want, I want help from you. Yeah. So it depends. There's a couple different ways. I do work with people one-on-one, um, and that's very individualized. It's very personalized. So we would look at, you as an individual, what are your symptoms? Um, we do kind of in-depth paperwork. Like I'll have, I would have someone do usually a a three-day food diary. Um, we do some labs probably, or look at whatever labs you have. So that's, I do work with people one-on-one. I also have a group program. Um, it's a fat loss program. So I was a personal trainer. I'm a personal trainer. So even before I became a nutritionist, I was a personal trainer. And so people kind of knew me for this. And this was, I've been helping women lose weight, you know, for eight years. And as I've gotten older and kind of moved into my more more mature business, really, I've, I've kind of helped, I've moved along. So now a lot of the women that I work with in this group are in their forties, um, or going through menopause. And so we're dealing with, you know, some hormones shifting and metabolism stuff. So it's, it's, we're looking at fat loss as a whole. And so the way that I look at weight loss is that, or weight gain is a symptom of, of health. And so once we get the foundations of your health and your metabolism and all of the pathways that we need, 
then weight loss is easy and it's natural and it's not something that needs to happen that is, you know, miserable or uncomfortable or like punishing. So my really, my, my mission, whether I'm working with someone one-on-one -on -one or in my group program is to empower people, to empower women, to give them the knowledge that they need, to feel their best, to look their best, to have the confidence and to feel like they know exactly what to eat and what to do for the rest of their lives, you know? So mm -hmm. a lot of what I love to do is to teach about nutrition, about mindset stuff. You know, again, we're not taught this. I think nobody, we're all, it doesn't matter if it's someone who is like, you know, a Hollywood star or someone in corporate America or my accountant or my next door neighbor who's a stay-at-home mom. Like we all have this universal kind of confusion about what to eat and what's the best thing and how to be healthy. And we're getting information from all these different sources. So I really want it to be very clear for every single person that I work with this is the right plan for me. So I don't have to look around at like what my aunt, sister's mom's cousin is doing. <laughs> like I know exactly how to eat for me, for my health, to feel my best, to feel vibrant, to have energy. Um, so that's a, I, I have a group program. Um, it's group coaching, but I also meet with each individual person at least one-on-one -on -one because okay. I feel very strongly about individualized, um, personalized nutrition. I don't, mm -hmm believe in just one size fits all. Yeah. Um, so when I was creating this program, I really wanted to take the best of having a community support system mm -hmm. and then also having that one-on-one -on -one individualized um, coaching. So, so priceless yeah, there's several idea. different ways that you could work with me and, you know, um, I also do lots of education and stuff on social media. So come find me if you're not ready to like jump in and work with somebody yet, you know, just come learn and I'm really happy to share any information that anybody needs or help to connect them with different resources or point them in the right direction. Um, this is so much bigger than just me or my business. You know, this is changing the uh, future of, you know, for, for ourselves, for our health, empowering, you know, ourselves to take control of our health, take control of our future um, for how we feel and how we show up in the world and, you know, health that extends into our forties, fifties, sixties, you know, nineties beyond. Mm -hmm. Right. And we have the power to do that. And yeah. the more people, the more women that know this, the, the better we can make it for future generations. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So how, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? And I'll give all your information on here as well. Yeah. Um, so my website is thefitcollective.co. So okay. thefitcollective.co. Um, or you can find me on Instagram, Katie Fitco. So K-A-T-I-E-F-I-T-C-O. Um, yeah. So either one and of I those. And I love, I just have to say and just acknowledge you for I mean, there are so many nutrition people on social media and you are so authentic on there and you're so real. And I think you make it so easy for people to understand. Again, a mom with four kids, you're juggling a lot. Um, so I just appreciate you. And I've been looking for someone to do this with me for a long time. And so I just, I know it was meant to be in the minute I saw your social media, uh, platform, I was like, she is definitely the one because I just know my clients can relate to you, make people feel really comfortable. Um, and you're just a real person, you know, who is back at you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. Well, I'm excited to continue this journey with you. And I know there's going to be, I, like I have so many more burning questions, but I don't want to confuse people. I think I'd like to do this again and talk. We did cover a lot. I feel like we, we covered a lot, yeah. not as much about the like, anti-inflammation diet, but you know, we can, we can give people more information about that. I have a lot of resources. So if people are more interested in finding out more about that, please reach out to me. I'm happy to, to send you some resources and point you in the right direction for sure. Yeah. yeah, no, I think we got, I think we covered a good amount and it gives people a good kind of like some groundwork to go on and, and hopefully they'll reach out to you or just get some more individualized work done as well. So thank you so much again You're so, welcome. so nice to meet you today thank you Karen like we've known each other for a long time <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah I'm excited to keep chatting